Uh, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining on our talk today. I know after lunch and the afternoon day two is tough, but we have our talk today on measuring the health of open source projects in public health. I'm Cynthia. I'll be the moderator today. Um, and to give a little bit more background of our project here. So GitHub and WHO have been partnering together for um, a while um, on their OSPO for a number of years. Um, the talk today will be focused on a specific project that came out of the OSPO partnership and we'll be demoing today as well. Um, what we built together is a dashboard to measure the health of WHO's open source projects. Um, and they have a number of them. The team at WHO and GitHub worked together for over a year um, to really build a comprehensive framework to track and analyze um, the WHO's projects across a select number of metrics. And what came out of that is um, another community um, type of dashboard that could, uh, that is of course, uh, public and could be used for other public health type of projects. Um, and of course, when we first started on this project, um, to do this team really needed to understand what metrics to use, um, how these metrics would then result in a type of decision making within WHO, within UN agency, and how to better engage with the open source community as well. So, but before we start, I want to um, have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Cassie here. Yeah, hi. Um, Clearly, everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, so yeah, Cassie, I have been working at the intersection of um, mainly public goods and technology for some years now. And then, yeah, so previously I worked in more of a humanitarian response where I did leverage open source, um, yeah, both like leverage and created like solutions for that. And then also had a great like joy of um, supporting WHO, OSPO, um, and such. So yeah, that's me. Hi, my name is Liliana Torres. I am a senior data analyst at GitHub. And my day-to-day -day job is to literally play with data, uh, to really give insights and solve problems for the company strategically. Um, I really enjoy to help others in my free time, like this project that we are about to showcase. And um, also in my free time, I love climbing mountains and rock climbing, which requires a lot of solving problems against uh, doing the same as I do at work every day. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Stanek. I'm a software engineer at GitHub. I work on the internal CI team. I don't work on actions, but I use actions. Hey everyone, I'm Sam Budia. I lead the open source program office at the World Health Organization. Uh, interesting fact, today is exactly two years since I joined um, the WHO and the OSPO. Uh, I just realized that before we started um, here. So a bit about myself, I was a developer and then moved to leading open source communities and then moved to the OSPO at WHO. Awesome. Um, yeah, please come on in. We just started. Uh, and yeah, while we have you, Sam, um, can you tell us a little bit more about WHO um, and also for anybody who may not be familiar with WHO as well? I think we have a slide here uh, too. Yeah, um, happy to do that. So um, a few, perhaps just at a high level, what WHO is, the World Health Organization, it is a UN agency, a UN specialized agency that leads on developing guidance on public health. Uh, so that's the main agenda of the, of the World Health Organization. But in addition to that, as has been uh, quite visible the last uh, maybe four or five years, uh, also leads and coordinates response to pandemics and epidemics and health emergencies in general. So the WHO is mostly ma made up of health experts, epidemiologists and so on, who work in this area of trying to support member states and the world at large to respond to health emergencies and uh, develop guidance on public health. And uh, perhaps uh, just moving on to the next and just talk about an example of uh, some of the work that is done on the technology side. So this particular project called GoData was in response to the Ebola pandemic in 
uh, Central Africa in 2017, and the need was to develop some technology or some something to help uh, epidemiologists do contact tracing and case management of the uh, of what was going on at that time. And this is some of the work that's that's happening uh, within the WHO. That's awesome. I think it's. Um very relevant to the most recent pandemic as well. Um, and it was one of these projects, I think, that was part of the reason why the dashboard was built, um, to be able to measure the health of all the number of projects that are on WHO's OSPO. And uh, we have a demo here as well that Liliana will show, uh, and then we can dig a little bit more about open source um, community as well. So I'm going to um, I'll do one, we're sliding the hand over to Liliana, so we, um, Make sure. I also want to shout out our, our GitHub project team and the WHO project team that worked together. So it was a large group of people that worked together on this dashboard. I do want to say a thank you. I wish we could all, they could all be here, but unfortunately, um, we are a small group. So um, and next time we'll have a bigger group. I'm going to hand this over to Liliana to do our demo, which is there. You go. All right. Um. As you see in here, it looks pretty simple, right? Um, you would think like, oh, this is like an Excel spreadsheet. You just build it up and that's it. But in the end, if you think about it, what it is behind the scenes to build this, there is a lot of work uh, to make it happen. It's a very simple dashboard, which was the, the idea of when you build a project, sometimes you want to go really simple to be able to expand and be able to be scalable. So as you see here, you have, it shows the total of repositories and when it was last updated. And um, we have a documentation a tab here that shows you what each metric means and how it's calculated for anyone that comes for the first time. Now in the repository, you think about like what it means to be healthy, right? Depending on what you're looking at the moment, you have different set of projects, you have topics, you have the licenses and the set of the metrics. And um, if I am looking for open source and we, and we think about it, I'm usually thinking about collaborators, right? I want my projects to have a lot of collaboration. And if I organize that by collaboration, I can see which are the projects that uh, WHO has with more collaborators. And I can dig into it to see if in these projects, how many issues do I have open? Do I have any closed issues? How many PRs did it have? Was it, has it been forked? Um, was it any, uh, is, is there any issues open right now? Or the average of those issues? I can filter and organize everything in the way that I looked at it, depending on what um, they were researching at the moment, right? Um, the greatest thing of this, also, you can download a CSV tool to span as well. But in here, you can also go to the repository directly and, and go from there. And what mainly this was is how can I look at those projects in a way that I can understand how they are, what does it mean to be healthy for them? Uh, of course, collaboration, of course, looking for expertise so they can also say, okay, all these projects, we need to think about how do we collaborate? How do we be more experts? Do we have a lot of open issues? Um, and also you can also filter each of them one at a time. Um, if I go to clear my filters, Go data was the one that was mentioned at the beginning. Um, and it can tell us that when it was four, how many PRs did it have merged, the average of the open issues. Of course, there is a lot to span and we'll talk a little bit more about when, whenever we continue. Thank you. Big screen. Awesome. Here you go. Hand that to you. Um, and that was our that was our backup. And our next slide. Um, so also, if anybody wants to take a look, at we do have a QR code up, so you can take a look at that. Um, so I want to dig it a little bit more into our questions I have for our panelists here. Um, in terms of the project itself, Lillian, you, you highlight a little bit of that. Do you think you can talk us through a little bit more of the strategy behind um, what was developed? And of course, with Rachel as well, who was part of the project, if you can go over um, the strategy behind the development. Um, sure. So the dashboard has a back end and a front end, <laughs> like a lot of projects. Um, the back end was originally uh, Go based, but we ended up, uh, interestingly, like halfway through um, switching it over to a Node.js TypeScript um, 
code base because we took a look at um, the WHO repositories um, and we saw that a lot of them were running on JavaScript. And then also the development team at the time was more familiar with TypeScript. So we found it was actually faster <laughs> to change the programming language. So that was kind of funny. Um, but how the backend works is it queries the uh, GitHub API um, and it gets uh, data statistics about the organization. And we actually tested this on the GitHub org, org and we haven't been rate limited yet. And that has like over like a thousand repos. <laughs> so it's pretty durable. Um, and then uh, what it does is it'll um, perform data transformations, aggregations, generate a JSON file. And then the front end is a, a Next.js um, static web page that reads in data from the JSON file and uh, it's hosted on GitHub pages and it just displays that data. Um, one of the other things we were debating was whether or not we wanted the dashboard to um, refresh automatically or like have the ability to like, you know, like have a button to refresh the data. Um, and for simplicity and speed sake, we went with a static web page. So to update the dashboard, um, you uh, run a GitHub action, which will requery the API and then redeploy the static web page. Awesome, cool. And it was just the, the one file that um, needs to be uploaded for the data set to be pulled. Is that from what I understand? Yeah, so the action will um, will run like the build command for the backend, and then um, that will generate the JSON file, and then it'll actually just deploy the JSON file in the Next.js app. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. I'm glad that's simple, especially for other organizations that want to adopt it. It's hopefully easier to adopt as well. Um, I'd love to know in terms of the obstacles that uh, you and the team had working on this project. Anything you guys encountered? Uh, so we wanted to include um, aggregate metrics, like what's like the average age of issues over the past 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have any time series data. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to do this, we would have had to set up a database and just for like speed and just to get something that Sam could use, um, we decided, you know, that would be a future um, endeavor. Mm -hmm. And Liliana, I think. Yeah, yeah and, and to add about the obstacles, um, when you build a dashboard like this, um, of course you want to do it all. Um, you want all the time series data, you want all the opportunities that you can get, and, and let's be honest, let's get something out there, right? Uh, for what the requirements was, uh, we took a look at that information and also we look at the Chaos Foundation to understand the metrics for the health. And from that, we cross reference it and we define the, the, the metrics that are more reliable in the way that we were building the dashboard. That was one of the areas. The other area is that, of course, when you're calling the API, you have rate limits, right? You cannot like be calling back and forth. And that was also one of the things that you needed to think about because if, if somebody's refreshing it every time and come a lot of people to it, it will, it will reach that limit. There was also, there is some limitations with the API as well because not all the data that was needed for certain metrics is available. So those kind of things, we needed to remove those metrics for the, for the, for the time being. And also the data storage as well. Um, in this case, of course, it's going to a JSON file, it's doing the transformation. It's, so we are not live doing the calculations as well because that also cost. Um, not everything is money, right? So in this case, it's cost of or expense of when you load the data. Of course, like in, in the perfect world, when you have the tool that you can refresh the data live, it's different. In this case, another obstacle was like, what tools do we have, right? When you have your day-to-day -day job, you have certain tools to work with. In here, we didn't have anything. <laughs> so you are like figuring it out. Thankfully, we had GitHub and we use all the tools from GitHub to be able to leverage this and also to try to make it as simple as possible so it can be built on top of it, right? And we have the, uh, this project for more collaborations. This is just phase one, but there is so much that you can really do with. Awesome. And you mentioned something about the, the metrics. Um, so we see here, of course, uh, the topics and licenses, collaborators, um, probably a question for also Sam as well, um, and uh, Liliana. In terms of metrics, how were you, how did you decide on which metrics to, to show and to use? 
So in the case of deciding the metrics, uh, like I mentioned before, um, uh, these metrics are metrics that could be calculated, transformed before we load the data. And also they are just general. They are not like, did the issue happen this month? And then we're calculating all the comments at the moment, or we are calculating how many, when it was open and to close, this was really general because the sake of being able to run it at a time, for that you need a database, right? You need to like be saving all the data by the time to be able to calculate those things. Of course, in the future, you can spend to that. But basically, um, we'll want also metrics that really help the organization to really get the answers, which is like they are looking on experts. They are also looking at what is the collaboration sense of the repository, how many people are watching it, um, do they have a, a specific license that they need to have? Uh, are there a lot of issues that, need, that are open? Do they have a long time to be closed? So mainly those were the basic metrics that we were able to pull from. I'll let Sam to spend to that. Um, yeah, I think on top of what you've covered already, uh, one I'd like, just like you mentioned before, to shout out to Chaos the Project because the, the work that's been done there was really instrumental in trying to think through what we need to be looking at. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, it's been two years and when I started, it, it was a matter of trying to figure out where where does the OSPO really need to support? What are the challenges that people are facing with the open source projects? And how can we ensure we know what exactly is happening and if our interventions and what we're trying to do to support them are helping and helping them move them in the right direction? So um, the first part was, again, just figuring out the bigger picture, looking at what people want to do. And mm -hmm. the answer to that was collaboration. It was about getting to work with experts uh, in private sector, in, in other public sector organizations, uh, developers across different uh, spheres of, of um, the world. And so the collaboration part of it was really important. And we I just went through what was available on the metrics for collaboration and community and tried to figure out what can we start with. Uh, we didn't we of course didn't think we'd be able to cover everything, but just look at a few important things that we can we can have, and then use those to inform what we do, whether it's uh, training on certain open source community uh, engagements, or looking at how people uh, work on GitHub, how long, I think as you can see, some issues would stay open forever, and that doesn't encourage contributions, and try and support to help alleviate some of the concerns that exist with the project. Awesome. And I'm also curious in terms of now the dashboard has been live for a little bit, um, how have the WHO OSPO used it to inform any decisions or is um, still a work in progress right now? It, it is a work in progress, and but at the same time, we, we have already made progress in terms of looking at this and mm -hmm. then trying to address uh, what's happening. Uh, mentioned again before, licensing was a big, big challenge from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, people weren't sure what licenses to use. And as a result, they were just putting their projects uh, publicly without a license because either they were not aware they should have a license mm -hmm. or they did not know what license to pick. And just looking at this table or this, looking at this dashboard and seeing how many projects don't have licenses mm -hmm. and which are those projects and who should we talk to just to ensure that they need to know that they need to have a license, that's something we're already doing and that's happening already. Uh, looking at the issues and those that have been open too long or those projects that have issues staying open too long and having um, some sort of uh, recommendations on how to address some of these issues um, is something that we're already doing. So we are seeing improvements mm -hmm. and perhaps this then leads to us thinking of what, are, what else should we be looking at so that we continue to support and continue mm -hmm. to work with, this, uh, with the projects to, to be better. I think that's a really good point, especially on, on the license part, because um, the, just because it's, um, like have public versus open source, that, that difference between the two. Um, and also leads me to the second topic of our talk today, talking about the working in the open, open source within the public sector and um, uh, public health as well. Um, I love to hear from Rachel. Uh, in terms of, um, as this project is also an open source community dashboard, and we'll also go to that too, which um, here. Uh, 
which is a community management dashboard that will then, uh, which is available for anybody to also use for their public health or public sector um, project. From your experience, tell us a little bit more about, you know, for any other public sector or other, anyone else who wants to contribute to public sector type of projects, any recommendations that you'd have for them? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, speaking as you know, a software engineer, I'm more on the coding side. Um, uh, getting into open source uh, for me was really intimidating at first. Um, I was really scared, uh, which is kind of silly because, you know, every I'm sure everyone here like works in open source in some way and you know everyone's been lovely and kind but you know when you're starting out it's a little intimidating um and i got my start because uh github it's a program cynthia runs actually um uh, it's called skills-based volunteering it's a program github has where they match um github employees with projects that they can volunteer on so that's how i got involved in this project um and I think, like, generally, you know, speaking, if you're trying to get into open source, um, being part of a project like that or, you know, just exploring, like, some repositories and reading some readmes is really good. Um, there's also, I believe, For Good First Issue, uh, yeah. which is, like, a site that we have that has a list of um, open source projects uh, for digital public goods yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um some great ways to get into open source yeah absolutely um for anybody who's unfamiliar with digital public goods i can do that very quickly um they are a list of registered open source projects like um don't, they don't have to be software they could be data as well um that number of un agencies and governments um uh, have a, it's not a certification, it's more of a registry of projects um, that are a public good um, and they contribute to any of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and on that, with uh, Sustainable Development Goals, I'd love to know from Cassie in terms of the metrics used for evaluating open source. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that and we'll dive into that too? Yes. <clears throat> Yes, so um, I come from more of a, so I was a aid worker, like in technology, um, that like leveraged technology very much, but I still think of my identity very much as a humanitarian development aid worker, not like as a tech person. And as all of us do, we are always very interested in metrics that's very hard to measure or impossible to measure like as you can imagine um yeah so when i thought about this like what are the metrics like because there are already very good metrics such as from chaos foundation um, but then specifically for public goods project like public health project what other what what are the metrics that would be different from other um let's say more tech focused open source project. And then like when we think about it, like especially if I were to put my aid worker hat, it's very much about the community adoption. And then especially like uh, Sam had mentioned GoData as a project that had initially um, emerged as an Ebola response. So we would be very interested in looking at, okay, so there is this uh, open source project and then how many people from the community, so for example, from the Sierra Leone, um, where the response is happening, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, how many developers from the community are contributing to it? This is like something that we would be really interested in looking at. And another thing that I would mention is that um, this type of public goods or humanitarian open source is uh, there's more research coming out um, that it's a really good place or there happen to be more underrepresented people like contributing to it, such as might be women, might be um, people, yeah, might be like uh, people with other um, like that doesn't belong to the majority really, yeah, in so that's also something we are very interested in looking at it. Like uh, it's not a direct um, sort of uh, output that we're trying to create, but like we've created this ground where more and more people who are, who um, really like want the, to contribute to the public goods, they come to it and contribute. So those are the metrics that we would look for. 
Awesome. And I think also, um, I'd love to hear from Sam about the WHO's uh, point of view in terms of the role of open source in public health space. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is, yeah, my, my day to day walk just to, to look at how we use open source, not just for the sake of open source, but for the sake of t technology, but for the sake of public health. And everything we do, even as OSPO, is trying to tie back to improving public health and uh, providing better health care for all. So one of the key things that I'm supposed to be doing or that I actually do every day is trying to think how we can set up um, the environment, the processes, the frameworks for the health experts to develop the solutions that are needed uh, to respond to health emergencies, to address the health challenges that exist. So in, in doing that, um, open source is becoming one of the key pieces of the puzzle of getting them to collaborate with others, getting them to bring in expertise that does not exist within an organization such as uh, the World Health Organization that's filled full of epidemiologists, not of software developers. So, and this is, this is working. This is something that is uh, seeing or bringing improvement in how we work together because um, I don't know if, I don't know how many people would know this, but in public sector, bureaucracy is a real, real problem where it takes months to just set up a contract with a vendor who, or with a company that would help you develop something. But with open source, you can start working on something tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We started working on this. I think we had one conversation yeah. and within a few weeks or mm -hmm. days, maybe we're already working on something. And that's, that's the power of open source and that's, that's what it can do. So I would not be able to say what health solution we're working on tomorrow, mm -hmm. but I would be able to tell you that it's probably going to be open source. That's awesome. And I think on that, um, before we wrap for QA, I think QA, um, since it is an open source project, uh, what are some of the features that maybe any of the audience here would like to contribute to to help um, on this project that you'd like to see eventually? Um, yeah. That, so, one, uh, since we're already working on with, with what we have, as we do that, we are seeing more um, things that now that we've addressed the, the, pro the challenge of issues not getting resolved quickly enough. So can we now see the trends in how issues are being addressed? Uh, and and the, trends, the, the trends over time is probably one of the interesting things that, that we can get from, from something like this to see uh, what, how what we're doing is helping uh, the open source projects. Mm -hmm. uh, something else I think which w would be very useful for me and for many others within the organization is to be able to visualize this information a bit better to see how we can interpret it in a bit of a, an easier way and a more visual way that tells mm -hmm. us uh, this is more than that or this is um, these are the these are the comparisons that you can make from, from different data sets and, and so on. So just a couple of things that come top of mind. Yeah, I think I'll also open that up to the rest of the panelists too. Should I go? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then another thing that we discussed together with like specifically GitHub OSPO team was um, this like mechanism, um, yeah, reading like JSON files. We talked about perhaps this could be used to manage dependency data as well, which is also, I'm sure so many people here um, have pains and like struggles like managing and then being able to see that would definitely, cause like right now here we are seeing sort of the surface, like no um, license or like licenses. And then like, oh, could we perhaps pull data that makes help, that helps people choose the license better? Like you see the dependencies and such. And yeah, this is the community version. Um, so I'm sure there are many, many open source compliance uh, enthusiasts in this room. So yeah, so that's uh, something that we had spoken about specifically for open source management. I think Casey took everything, all the information I was going to say, but it's okay. We know what we're doing right here. Um, <laughs> But yeah, if, 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 you, if you put those things together that Sam and Cassie said, it's all about the database. Does anybody wants to help to have a database? So yeah, um, and if you think about it, um, with data, you need historical, right? You need to be able to, to see all these projects historically and visualize it different. So right now we can't, 
because we are just pulling the data automatically, transforming it and just showing it. Um, and without a database, it was impossible. We thought about the idea of doing it, but if you run all of that process to be able to have updating each time, we will have the page down, right? Every minute and nobody's going to be, be able to see it. Um, one of the areas was the dependency, which is that the future, the future phases of this project, which is already in the community as adding the database, which is very important. Um, database, uh, and also that area of the dependency. There is also other data points that cannot be displayed yet, that could probably be, but they just have to find the ways um, if, uh, if, if, you, if, if, if we were to pull it from GitHub, because some areas like, oh, we want to see the projects who is collaborating, but not everybody shares where they are from, uh, what is the uh, gender. So it's all very personal. In GitHub, we don't, we don't ask people put where you are from or put if you, if, how do you identify yourself because we respect that a lot, but it's nice to see it. And sometimes it's very helpful. Like when you have that information in there, you can have an idea of what is the diversity that you have in there in those projects. And that's something in the future that as we, we can enable more data from the API, we can be able to see and, and understand from those projects, how can we diversify them? Awesome. And Rachel. Yeah. Um, so if anyone is really passionate about refactoring code, um, I, there were quite a few things that I did want to refactor, so, um, and that could be refactored. <laughs> um, everyone, like, don't get up all at once, you know? Like, <laughs> there is always room for refactoring, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I think, yeah. Um, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'll just add something because I'm, I, I'm not sure it, it came out very clearly to, to the audience that um, after we worked on the project together, WHO and GitHub, uh, this then moved to become its own independent open source project. So this mm -hmm. has the open source side of it. Yes. And then we have what we um, then pull from, from the open source project to run what we have on WHO side. Mm -hmm. So we do rely on what's happening upstream and uh, those improvements would be really, really useful for us. That is definitely noted. Hint to the audience on that. I know that we are almost at time, so we have some time for questions. And I see a hand up. Um, I Um, yeah, so we are working with Omar and, and with others uh, in UN agencies as part of a working group uh, called the Digital Technology Network, uh, I believe, um, uh, trying to discuss a few of the things that you already mentioned up there. Uh, so the reason, and I, if you remember, Cynthia, we discussed this at the beginning, that we really, really wanted this to be open source and to be available to others to use. And that, that this was part of it, just to make it available to others who perhaps at that point did not have capacity to try and implement um, such tools for their OSPOs or for their open source work. So this is something that's available to them. Um, but within those groups, there are also other discussions just around the hosting of code that uh, is just running parallel to this and we're trying to see how we can align in some cases we may not fully align and we may have to all operate independently within our agencies but in many cases we're trying to see how we can work better together awesome thank you yeah yes Um, yeah, really good point. Um, I think what's like also important is that we had like hundreds of projects and then they're all very unique and different and some of them perhaps are more related and interlinked. So um, in order to summarize, we, we want to make sure that it's not lost in context. Yeah, because um, some are contact tracing app and some are our health data standards.
So like it's 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 really like not fair to put like apples and pears together. Yeah. So it's like instead of um giving wrong information, it's better to give like everything and in a way like let the reader figure out. And something to add to that. Um, also, I think you're seeing as a summarized what is the overall health um, because this was the phase one of the project. Of course, um, we'll have to build a phase two where like. The setup right now is we'll have to like get another JSON file and build another page, right? To be able to 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 summarize how many projects are good in in that good health for what they determine. Right now is this page is just more to exploring each one of them separately than overall. And of course, like this is why it's in the community for that phase two to get all that all that information um, summarized in more tabs. Because ideally, when you have a report, you just don't want one. You want to like to tell a story, right? Um, this is just the beginning of them, kind of like okay, now we have visibility. Before they couldn't see anyone, anything. They have to go to each product, a project, click on it, and see all that information and try to see what they come up with. So. Uh, just to add to that, now that I've had some time to think back about what we talked about <laughs> months ago, um, so we were actually, so I don't, I don't think I made this actually very clear, but um, the there's a config file, um, and you can actually just change the org in the repository, or sorry, you can just change the org name, and then it's kind of like a, you just change the org name, and then you can run it, and then you can get stats on your own org and your own repos in that org. Um, so because we wanted to make this kind of like usable by different organizations and stuff, we didn't, it's really hard to say, like, determine like what's important, uh, you know, for each different organization. So like Liliana was saying, like, this was a, kind of a phase one, like it, it is really overwhelming having all the data, but like. You know, let's just like give everyone <laughs> all the data and then they can determine like what's important and what isn't. Um, but we also were, um, as we were developing, we were talking about wanting to have another page uh, with some summaries because it is a lot of data. Um, and like some graphs and visualizations would be really nice. And then we were also talking about too, um, maybe making the columns, um, like giving the users the ability to reorder the columns. So that way you could see like what's important like first to your org. Oh, to to wrap it to wrap it up, uh, the short answer yes. Um, so how we are doing it right now? Uh, like I agree with all the points, but then uh, just giving my version of the response, how we're doing it right now because it's the export function. We export. I'm exporting that as a CSV, and for example, looking at the average number of collaborators across all the different repositories. Also looking at just things like average um, or total number of repositories without licenses, or total number of repositories with specific uh, copyleft or. Um, and so on. So we are we are doing that, but it's more it's happening outside of the dashboard currently. But as mentioned, uh, with future versions, we are hoping we can get that within the dashboard. Awesome, good question. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, please. Uh, the, the projects that you monitor in the dashboard are these all projects initiated by the WHO or owned by, or can it also be external ones that you use that are actually interesting? How is that? So. Um, I'd say n most, perhaps more than 90% are initiated within WHO. Within that, there's some forks of projects that we use, but we're, tr we're like, as just part of best practice, we're not, we're trying not to, just to encourage people to contribute upstream rather than uh, fork and, and maintain our own version of the projects. So, but majority of them are initiated by WHO. Awesome. All right, 30 more seconds, last question. Oh, yeah, please. Any big surprise that any of you had to write the project? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, to anybody, big surprise. We didn't make any money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say one from my end, I was the one who led the project. When I, when, I, when I started doing this project, I was like, how am I gonna lead something I don't even know how to do? Um, I'm a software engineer, and, but I work more on the data side. It's not exactly the same. But the nice thing is like I found all these cool engineers that they even 
taught me how to code the way that they were coding that. So I was like, okay, I did my PR, I did it. So um, those are the things that you encounter on these projects, a lot of surprises, of course, timing between all of us. Um, you don't have full time to do this, right? And you want to finish it. So the first, at the, the beginning when you start doing it, you are like, okay, it's going good. And somebody is like, oh no, I'm full of work. I cannot help right now. Um, and some others came in and helped, but we will just figure it out. I was like, one day at a time, one opportunity at a time, let's see where we go, where we can do it. And we did it as a team and we all worked together to, to get to the final end. Even all the teammates are not today. Those are like big surprises. And sometimes like, uh, when I saw they were changing the code to another language, I was like, what is this going to be like crazy? Like, I don't know. I don't want to tell anything to them, but I am just going to like, don't say anything and hope for the best, right? Because it's like, they are redoing it again. But it all worked out, right? Because when you trust in your team and their knowledge and what they can do, and you give it out to them, even though I was the lead, I was like, I'm not telling them what to do. I'm trusting that they tell me what we should do with what we need to do. So to add to that, um, last time I touched like JavaScript, uh, type, TypeScript was like three years ago. JavaScript, I think, was like six years ago. So this was like back when we had Redux Saga. Um, so kind of just seeing all the new frameworks out there now, and I'm like, what is next JS? <laughs> that was like kind of a big shock for me. <laughs> all right. Oh, any last? To the team, if not, uh, well, outside the technology, yeah. most of the contributions still to date came in 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So, tells you how willing people are to contribute to help the world. All right, don't wait for the next pandemic, everybody. Um, and to wrap up, thank you everybody for taking time for this session. Um, and uh, Rachel did mention the four good first issue. If you don't want to, just want to take a look at a good first issue to contribute to. Um, that is a QR code for a list of other um, open source um, within the social sector type of um, uh, projects or issues that you can contribute to. You can take a look at that. And that concludes our talk today. Thank you so much for our panelists um, for taking time to chat with us. Thank you. Thank you.